So for this session, um, the positive ROI of graduate outcomes data, um, we're gonna try to make it a little more interactive. So we'll pause between each core topic to invite storytelling, questions, um, you know, any input or contributions from the audience. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so Dr. Jacob Bonney, you probably all know by now, the analytics consultant for Stepping Blocks and myself, um, Aaron King, marketing manager for student success, will be leading this presentation today. Um, we'll open this up along the way for conversation, questions, feel free to use the chat um, to ask questions as well along the way. So really, the purpose of this session um, is to learn how initiatives powered by graduate outcomes data pay for themselves. So when graduate outcomes data supports your programs, you retain students, you improve completion rates, you increase funding, and ultimately retain dollars and resources to reinvest in the following year. So graduate outcomes data also guides decisions for prospective students to along with current students. So if your institutional outcomes are attractive and relevant, your enrollment improves and so does your bottom line. So in this session, we'll showcase how to use graduate outcomes data to change behavior and make an impact. Um, so these are the, the core topics we'll cover, the four key drivers of a positive ROI, starting with um, improving time to degree, increasing your enrollment numbers, um, greater alumni giving, encouraging donations, and better employer partnerships. And with that, the data-driven roadmap will start with um, funding sources and requiring outcomes data. So Dr. Barney, I'll pass this on to you. Absolutely. Thanks, Aaron. So uh, my background is in uh, student success. I spent a number of years uh, working directly with uh, an institution in a state with performance-based funding. Uh, for those who might be familiar with performance funding, uh, certainly we had a lot of great conversations around uh, how to improve outcomes as required uh, by, by our state. But in addition to performance funding, there's a variety of different uh, data sources, or excuse me, funding sources, uh, and all of those funding sources tend to rely on data. So if anybody's joining us from institutional research uh, or an IR unit, I'm sure you're very familiar with uh, state reporting or reporting to uh, grants and other funders, uh, donors and, and whatnot. So this is, it's really a case where as you improve your data and your data ecosystem, you're able to position yourself in, in ways that either meet uh, mandates and, and metrics or allow you to seek out new sources, uh, again, through don donors or grants. Uh, and so we just wanted to kind of begin this sort of conversation as we talk about some specifics with this sort of overarching theory and, and conversation around uh, thinking about data, data literacy, and, and leveraging uh, many of the metrics that, uh, that institutions are, are being asked to be accountable for. Uh, things like you know equity and graduation outcomes, completion rates, transfer success rates, credit hours earned, and, and postgraduate success certainly. Uh, and so there are a variety of funding, uh, sorry, a variety of data sources for that information, uh, and certainly uh, you know mixed methods or multi-tiered uh, approach to triangulating the data is helpful. And, and we'll be talking about that more uh, throughout the conversation tomorrow. All right, so starting with, um, you know, one of the key indicators, so improving time to degree. Um, so time to degree is an important indicator of student success, but what causes the lag? Um, so institutional transfers, so the more often a student transfers, that that's cor correlated um, with a longer time to degree, poor academic planning, changing a major, or enrolling in courses that don't count towards a, a degree. So Dr. Barney, did you have anything to add to this part of the conversation? Sure, you know, I, I think there's a lot of institutions that have uh, programs around degree completion, uh, whether we call it Think 30, 15 to finish, uh, really, you know, there's, there's a variety of different uh, names for some of these campaigns. Uh, and and I, I think a key element here is how to encourage students to make progress and, and take their courses, uh, but also kind of as, as Aaron said, um, ensuring that those courses ultimately count towards their degree. And that's where conversations around career development uh, and or you know that uh, college to career pathway is really important. And, and, and it's very important to have those conversations early in the process. Uh, that way students uh, don't spend a couple of years working towards 
uh, one degree and then and then change their mind and, and shift. Uh, some of the, the research that I have seen indicates that changing your major early in the first year, year and a half, doesn't really impact time to degree uh, versus, you know, certainly a, a very dangerous uh, major change in your junior year that would absolutely lead to uh, an extension of time at uh, your institution. So I'm not sure if anybody has any other thoughts or ideas around how perhaps your institution is uh, trying to encourage students to, you know, make these uh, make this forward progress in a timely fashion. Yeah, feel free to raise your hand or add your question and thoughts to the chat and um, we'll share it out loud. Um, so this is an interesting stat, probably something we're all pretty familiar with, but the average length of um, enrollment for bachelor's degree earners from a four-year public institution is 5.2 academic years. And so poor time to degree metrics ultimately penalize students um, you know, it leads to financial implications for students, um, you know, and insufficient financial resources um, that causes stopouts and part-time enrollment. Student debt obviously can increase um, when, uh, you know, time to degree increases and earnings are foregone when you don't graduate on time and get that first job. Anything I missed here, Dr. Bonnie, or anything from the audience, um, you know, any other ways that students are penalized when um, it takes longer for them to earn their degree? I'm not, not seeing anything else in the chat. I will say, uh, you know, a, a conversation I've also had with students over the years is uh, once you hit that uh, that six year mark of, of a bachelor's degree, we, we could have gotten a, a master's degree at the same time. So interesting to kind of think about those conversations. Uh, and, and I'm sure I know there's at least uh, a couple of folks in the audience who work with graduate students, but uh, but very often I would have conversations with students uh, if they were interested in a major change, you know, in their junior year depending on where they were heading, sometimes it, it, it's better to uh, encourage the student to go to graduate school right away rather than, uh, you know, make that major swap. So lots of uh, lots of interesting strategies on how to support students. And and certainly I, I know it, in several places uh, when we're talking about metrics, uh, enrollment in a graduate program counts as a, a successful post-graduation success. Although certainly we're worried uh, quite a bit about the workforce uh, as well in that conversation. So I'll just keep moving through if no one else has anything to share. Um, so how to improve time to degree. Um, this you know, takes different shapes across um, various institutions and this can look different um, depending on your um, capacity and your resources. Um, but promoting benefits of earning a degree from your institution um, is one way. Um, offering course selection resources that align with real career paths that are informed by graduate outcomes data and introducing those career paths early on, like Dr. Bonnie mentioned, um, to help students select a major, plan their coursework and stay on track um, and delivering personalized support to students at, at scale. So the way this takes shape at Georgia State University, what you're seeing here, and um, I think many of you in the audience have probably already seen before, um, these are their college to career majors pages. Um, so this is powered by stepping box data, both the national um, analytics and the institutional analytics. So the goal here is really future flexibility. Um, it's Georgia State wants to help their students realize, um, you know, the, the real career paths are real people and it doesn't always, it's not always linear. So you might get a degree in English and that's what we're looking at now, but you might end up working in a different industry and that's okay. Um, there are um, pathways out there to take, um, good pathways that have, you know, good salaries and, um, you know, job titles and skills that you may be interested um, in earning. So that's really the goal here. Um, the second goal, um, delivering personalized support to students at scale. So all of their career pages link to their career resources, including stepping blocks. So um, the goal here is to, you know, speak directly to the students uh, about relevant degrees things they might be interested in and help push them down that path to explore more as early as possible. Um, here's another example um, of a major page. This is, this is the top portion um, for political science. You can see on the right side, this is where they connect to their career resources, whether that's stepping blocks, whatever it is you want to promote on, um, on your pages. Again, it doesn't have to take shape of a web page. Um, it can be an infographic, it can be an email, it can be a workshop. It doesn't have to be a physical page that you, you're trying to earn traffic to. Um, but earlier this year, we sat down with 
And Dr. Timothy Rennick, who is the executive director for the new National Institute for Student, Student Success um, out of Georgia State University. And he shared that for every 1%, uh, Georgia State improves its retention rate. It's worth about $3.3 million per year in additional tuition and fee revenues. Um, and one of the steps that he recommends to do first is to get the, get the house in order and get leadership on the same page. And you do this by leading with evidence, with program-based evidence of where degrees are doing well and where they aren't and where improvements need to be made. Um, and then the next step can look something like this, um, displaying and distributing those outcomes, um, the outcomes data and giving that information to students um, as early as possible. So I will pause here. Dr. Barney, did you have anything to add um, you know, to the Georgia State conversation? Um, I'm gonna actually go back a page, um, you know, different ways to improve time to degree based on promoting benefits, um, course selection resources, anything, you know, along those lines or anything from the audience. I have a question from uh, Bridget in the chat. Um, what do you mean by degrees are doing well? So in that, that will depend on, um, you know, your institutional definition of, you know, the metrics that you're looking at. It could be, you know, the employers that you are trying to get your, um, your, your graduates to, to end up at, the top employers, um, the skills that they're earning, um, the supply and demand of skills, uh, you know, from your institution um, based on, you know, other institutions and what those companies are looking for. Um, so it, it really depends and can vary. Um, Dr. Barney, do you have anything? I'm sure you have more to add to that. Certainly, yeah. I mean, I think from a student success perspective, another way to think about that is uh, even going back to time to degree and, and what majors or what programs might take a little bit longer uh, for students. Um, certainly another element there is uh, what are the uh, internship or co-op opportunities uh, in, in a variety of programs and, and what percentage of students are graduating with you know, those uh, successful co-curriculars or um, high impact practices on their uh, resumes. So I, I think you could certainly look at that in a variety of ways and, and it's helpful, especially uh, kind of going back to Dr. Reddick's comments about getting the house in order, uh, great opportunity to engage with academic leadership, the deans of various colleges to think about uh, you know, where uh, they might uh, improve any of these angles as we're talking about student success and, and a pathway to graduation and, and successful employment. You might have one college with a really high participation rate in internships and co-ops, but uh, a, a lag to graduation time. And so how do you sort of find that balance between encouraging students to graduate on time, but also still make it into high impact practices uh, which we know are so important for their future success as well. So lots of different angles. I think a great opportunity for institutions to take, uh, you know, a little bit of a reflective approach and think about uh, what they're doing uh, to to uh, meet all of those various potential metrics, knowing that sometimes those metrics compete directly with one another. And we do have a lot of questions. Um, I'll just answer this proactively. We have a lot of questions about how Georgia State does this. Um, and I can say that the data is easy to get and provide, so the graduate outcomes data, um, but the way that it takes shape on your end, um, it, it's all dependent on, you know, the resources and capacity and, um, you know, really your goals. So it can look a number of different ways, but the data itself um, is something that we can work with, with you on um, to help pull and, you know, help you decide where that stuff may end up. I'm going to keep moving through. Dr. Barney, do we have any other questions in the chat? Nope, uh, we're good for now. Okay. Okay, so moving on to number two, which is um, improving your enrollment numbers. Um, and this, as it relates to graduate outcomes data, um, is about increasing prospect conversions by providing immediate and transparent value related to programs. Um, so one specific way to do this is by connecting your public program and major specific pages to data-driven career resources to drive interest and conversions. So whatever that is on your side, um, whether that's the step in the box personality assessment, um, whether you have you know, other personality assessments you use, other, um, you know, maybe handshake or whatever resource it is that you're trying to promote, but putting it out there in the public pages that are easy for prospective students to access and find um, that speak directly to them based on their initial interest um, when they come to visit your site to, to look around 
for the first time. Um, and then beyond that, it's it's about you know collecting that contact information and your enrollment teams delivering those relevant promotions to to help encourage enrollment um, you know down the line. And then um, the lastly, you know this appeals to parents seeing the graduate outcomes. So Dr. Barney, we spoke about this earlier. So if you wanted to expand on that. Yeah, absolutely. I could talk about parents uh, for a, a very long time. Uh, that was actually the, the focus of my dissertation was about how uh, students uh, utilize technology to uh, get support from their parents. But in any event, I, I think there's a great opportunity here to think about how we are communicating post-graduation outcomes to students uh, at, at a, variety a variety of points in, in their cycle. And of course, including that information uh, in conversations with parents as well, whether that's visiting days, you know, prior to uh, prior to enrollment, throughout the orientation process, throughout the first year, uh, and certainly kind of along the pathway as well. So, uh, I know a lot of institutions have parent-specific Facebook pages. How are you sharing resources and encouraging uh, your campus to to get connected with students? Uh, oftentimes, uh, in my experience, sharing information with with parents and family. Uh, often led to direct action by the student as you have an additional ally to help support the student. So, uh, you know, there might be a great opportunity for a, a parent focused campaign or family focused campaign around using the stepping block student platform, for example. So uh, some great strategies uh, and and certainly very helpful to, uh, to, to ask for family support, uh, especially with critical topics like uh, next steps after graduation. Okay, uh, I don't see any other questions or comments right now, so I'll just keep moving through, but again, feel free to, to interrupt us at any time. Um, so number three is about alumni engagement and giving. So encouraging donations and community uh, with targeted campaigns using data. So structuring every campaign around an alumni group um, in their professional, regional, or cultural identities. And one way you can do this, if you attended the masterclass session yesterday for Graduate Explorer, um, that's really the, the intention behind, behind that solution is to help um, segment these populations. So supporting your mission with segmentation, um, establishing affinity groups, whatever that looks like, industry-based, um, you know, based on geography, gender, um, based on income, um, you know, finding those donation matching employers is another, is another um, key segment to look for. Dr. Bonnie, any thoughts on alumni engagement and giving using data? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, there's there's so many different opportunities to segment and, and provide a, a tangible, uh, specific, uh, you know, uh, opportunity to connect. Uh, we know uh, with human nature that anything that is uh, individualized is, is more likely to yield success than something that is general. And so anything that you can do to kind of provide those specific uh, connections is, is very helpful. On Thursday, we're going to be talking about, you know, engaging with alumni kind of in broad terms. And, and I think I'm looking forward to that conversation to hear some of the strategies that folks are implementing uh, in that space. Because uh, I do think there's there's a lot of great opportunities and, and resources to uh, connect with folks, folks, especially as uh, communications and, and outreach has shifted as a result of uh, the pandemic. So lots of lots of in interesting opportunities uh, to, to engage with folks. Okay, and number four, better employer partnerships. So understanding hiring trends at the institutional level, um, being able to analyze the supply and demand of skills from your university by company to help close those skills gaps. Um, we are having a talk tomorrow led by Dr. Bonnie specifically to talk about closing skills gaps using um, the graduate outcomes platform. So definitely tune into that if it's something you're interested in from you know the functional level. Um, also understanding employers um, who might be trending down, maybe they used to hire a lot of your um, alumni, but they don't anymore. So understanding, you know, why that relationship is falling off and um, reigniting it and strengthening that relationship, um, you know, for, for better long term outcomes. Um, also identifying and engaging with alumni at target companies based on based on your goals. Any thoughts on that, Dr. Bonnie? Yeah, certainly many opportunities to collaborate. Uh, often employers uh, are not aware of uh, the outcomes and the data that you have on your side. And so uh, coming to a, a conversation or, or collaborative meeting with uh, with an employer is, is really, really powerful uh, to help highlight uh, the value that you're adding uh, to 
you know, that company and, and perhaps have a great conversation about skills and, uh, and where there might be some uh, opportunities for improvement, certainly, but, but also where you are meeting their needs uh, on a regular basis. So I, I know there's a lot of folks, uh, a lot of Stepping Blocks uh, partner schools are, are leveraging this to, to have some great conversations with employers, but um, certainly there's always opportunities to think about this in, in new and uh, transformative ways so that we can uh, help bridge that gap uh, for folks. So feel free to join us tomorrow. A small plug for our, our conversation about the skills gap. I think we'll have a lot of good conversations about uh, you know, the tangible and intangible skills that students are acquiring in college um, and how that might uh, work. <laughs>